Good morning. Welcome to day three of Next 2018. My name is Eric Schmidt. I'm a developer advocate in the Google Cloud Platform team. You can reach me on Twitter at NotThatEric. If you were expecting the other Eric Schmidt, I apologize. Hopefully, you're in the right room. This session is architecting live NCA predictions from archives to insight. You can also reach me at cloudy, cloud with an E, at google.com if you want to have a private conversation outside of Twitter. How many of you have ever built a house or remodeled a house or know a friend who's remodeled a house or built a house? Um, this is a picture of a, a, a house I remodeled a little while ago. And I was trying to figure out how to start the talk, and I realized that this is a, a great way to set context for what this talk is about. Building a house is really hard, and without plans, and without a lot of communication, a lot of different tools and collaboration, you more than likely fail. Uh, fortunately, through a lot of trial and error, um, I'll show you a picture maybe later about what this ended up looking like, but kind of keep this in mind. As you're building something, it's important to have a foundation, it's important to have a plan, and uh, a lot of patience. This is one of my plans. What's this talk about? This talk about is, is about three things. It's about NCA and basketball. It's about the Google Cloud. And it's about predictive workflow, specifically for live TV advertisements. How many people are into basketball? How many people are into cloud? Predictions? <laughs> wow, we have a pretty good uh, Venn here. This is great. Awesome. I'm going to walk between these three concepts, uh, jumping back and forth. It'd be awesome to do this talk linearly, but it would also be impossible. And it, most of what I'm going to share with you are things that happened to myself and several other, several meaning 15 to 20 people in real time, in real life. And I'm going to share with you some of the best practices that we learned and applied along the way. Real quickly, since this talk is about the NCAA, if you don't know who the NCAA is, uh, it's important to understand. So the NCAA is the governing body for collegiate sports. And at the end of the day, their mission is to help be an integral part of higher education for college student athletes and to provide an environment for them that's safe, productive, and help build some of the most amazing championships on the planet. How did we get here? How did this talk happen? How did these ads happen? Back in December of 2017, Google Cloud became the official cloud provider for the NCAA. The NCAA is, has a lot of kind of typical challenges, uh, or has a lot of challenges of a typical enterprise, although people may not think of the NCAA as an enterprise. But the NCAA manages hundreds and hundreds of schools times the number of sports, thousands of sports. It's just not about basketball. You have football, baseball, soccer, etc. They have decades and decades of competition information and student athlete information. This partnership was grounded in helping the NCA build the future of their analytics platform to help them understand in more detail potentially what's happening with some of their sports and some of the competitions in areas that they may have had a blind spot to or they wanted to get more insight into. The campaign was know what your data knows. So they have lots of data, uh, but there are areas that we wanted to dig deeper. One of those was supporting the development of a refined championship selection process. So kind of looking at like how are teams selected to be in some of the championships that they manage. So the partnership started uh, in December, kind of based on these three ideas. How many of you are fans of March Madness? OK. Now that uh, for some of you that didn't understand or know who the NCAA was, uh, March Madness is a championship tournament that happens every year. Guess what month it starts in? March. There are 351 NCAA Division I schools that compete for a spot to participate in this 64-team tournament. 
there's a women's tournament and a men's tournament. This talk is primarily focused on the men's tournament. So you have 351 teams. They all are vying f to get into a spot into this, into this tournament. The NCAA oversees the selection process, so which teams get in and then how they're seeded into the tournament. That process is very data-driven, primarily using historical game data to make decisions about what teams deserve the right to play in the tournament. Google Cloud, as part of this fantastic madness around March Madness, we decided that we were going to build six live television ads to run during the final four games. Anyone want to guess how many games are in the final four? Three. So, so we ran two ads, one for each game. And this is the journey that we took to build out these live television ads. Let's take a trip. How many of you have been to uh, Austin, Texas? Not Austin. Um, how many of you have been to the Alamo Dome? OK. So April 2nd, 2018, there was a, a truck sitting right about here. And the national championship game was going on inside of this building. This is me right there. I'm only self-identifiable by my gray hair. So we're watching the game, and as soon as the, the clock hit 0-0 zero, zero at halftime, we built an ad that didn't exist prior to the clock going to 0-0 zero, zero from scratch, and we ran it live on air, predicting what would happen in the second half. So kind of immerse yourself in being in this truck. This truck is roughly 10 by 12. It's super hot. It's filled with about 13 people. We're watching a game that about, say, 80, 100 million people are watching. I don't know how many people are watching the game. A lot of people. And we have to go run an ad. By the way, this guy right here is one of my uh, main partners on this project. And he doesn't look too happy right now. But uh, let's watch an ad. What did we build? So that ad ran uh, roughly four minutes into the beginning of the game. Turns out possessions are pretty important in basketball because you can't score if you don't have the ball. Um, turns out pace is super important in basketball because if you're behind, uh, you need the ball in order to score. So 130 possessions, is that good? Is that bad? Is it a lot? We'll find out. But that was our, that was our estimate. That was our prediction. So, how did we go from building in that ad, running that ad, sitting in that truck, how did we get there? This is the overall architecture that we ended up building. So we started building this late November, early December, right around the start of this relationship with the NCAA. Starting on the left-hand side, we have raw data, starting and then finishing on the right side, we have a television ad. Voila, we're done, we're out. Um, no, there was several pieces that we had to put together. And we're going to walk through this left to right. Now, if you're not into uh, product logos and you think more in terms of, kind of workflow and tasks, this is a different way to look at this talk. So we're going to talk about orchestration and subject matter expertise, business requirements, et cetera. You're going to see several probably 15 of these uh, green slides. These are best practices. If you take nothing away from this talk, try to remember what's on these green slides. I showed you the architecture. Step one, if you're going to go build something like this, form a team of discrete subject matter experts. People, know, people who know what they know really, really well and also know what they don't know. Our team effort looked like this. We had basically two kind of 
camps of folks, I'll call them the techie people and the non-techie people. So the left column, we had a, a tech partner lead, someone who worked closely with the NCA and other uh, technology groups. We had a, a, a gentleman on the team who is a deep, deep NCA basketball expert. We had folks that just did data engineering, some folks that just did software engineering, some people were quants, other people were just focused on data science and machine learning engineering. Then on the business side, we had a business partner lead. Again, folks were working with the NCA, working with Turner, et cetera, people writing copy, making sure that what we were doing was on brand, that the ad process was working right, PR folks, legal folks, and ultimately some editors, and one of them's in the audience today. So you have this collection of people, and the reason why I point this out is I've worked on probably 100 of these projects, and I'll always ask, who's your data engineer? And the data science guy or girl says, um, we, we don't have one. That, that's kind of me. I just, I just do that on the side. I'm like, uh, how much time are you then spending doing data engineering versus actually doing data science work? And you start getting into this, this challenge of not being able to focus on the things that you're really, really good at. Now, that's not to say that it's OK to kind of cross over. But if you're trying to do something really big, make sure that you're staffed appropriately around the, the disciplines that you need in order to be successful. And as you'll see, like, there's no way that a single machine learning engineer sitting in one of our data centers by themselves could pull something like this off without a ton of other support. Next one. And I, I promise you, you'll see some code here soon. Um, the next one is write down business requirements. Scope as soon as possible and communicate with precision. So th that group of technologists talking to the group of, of business folks, in the beginning, it was hard for us to communicate because we weren't writing down things. We are like, oh, yeah, we're going to build these ads. But what do you mean we're going to build ads? How many do we need to build? Uh, when do they run? How fast do they need to get done, et cetera? And then iteration is key. So decisions that we make today or decision that we made, say, made today, three days from now, more than likely we're going to tweak that based on new inputs, both from the technology side as well as the business side. So how do we get to business requirements? These were, these were words that I, I distinctly remember in meetings. Um, you can kind of guess which ones maybe come from the business side versus the technology side. Right? So people say, like, hey, we want these ads to be delightful. I'm like, cool. Uh, what does that mean, right? And then the folks on the technology side is like, how, how precise do we have to be? And then the legal guys would be like, don't be too right, but don't be too wrong. <laughs> As one of the leads on this project, I was always thinking, like, is this even feasible? Like, uh, like can we pull this off? Like, uh, so we wrote a bunch of documents, and we started to get very crisp and clear about what a lot of these words meant. From there, we started to narrow down scope as a means to start building a predictive workflow. So we had some team roles. So first and foremost, this had to be on brand. So it had to feel like Google. It also had to feel like the NCAA. It had to be contextual. It had to be about basketball. It had to be about the game that was happening. It had to have mass appeal. Like I wanted to run ads that were just around dunks. but. Turns out, not everyone likes dunks. Uh, and then we had this idea of Goldilocks outcome. So it couldn't be too hot, and it also couldn't be too cold. And so then we had a bunch of other things, like don't be too basketball-y, needs to feel delightful. Um, and then, by the way, all this system that we were building on the workflow side needed to be executed in under two minutes. So everything else aside, as soon as that clock hits zero, we have two minutes to basically hand off information to our creative team to go build an ad. Then we finally got to this. I wrote this down, printed it on my wall, and then didn't sleep for four months, which was build X number of real-time predictions to power the development of six television ads. Each of these have to run in under 10 minutes from start to finish like for them getting traffic with Goldilocks accuracy while being prepared for hundreds of game scenarios. How many of you knew who was going to play in the Final Four games or championship games whenever the tournament started? Cool. All right. A lot of uh, honest people in this audience. So how did we get there? Step one, collect data. Step three, ads. Um, 
that's a joke from South Park. Uh, it's probably too old, but. Um, so we're going to work left to right. As we were building out this new analytics workflow for the NCA, we got a very close, intimate um, uh, with the data that they had. And we're talking about decades and decades worth of competition data. At the same time, we also worked with a, a, a data provider called Sport Radar. They are a um, provider of real-time sport information, and they also support uh, the NCA as well as uh, Turner Broadcasting. And the reason we worked with them is they have real-time information about what's happening on the court versus the majority of the NCA data is all historical in nature. So step one, collect data. How many of you love XML? All right. Uh, I wrote the first, uh, one of the first XML partner parsers at, at Microsoft about 15 years ago. I thought it was the best thing on the planet. It turns out that there are other um, uh, encoding formats that uh, are a little bit better. But historically, we had to deal with tens of thousands of these files that represented what happened in these NCA games. Some of them are 15, 20,000 lines long. How many of you love JSON? All right, slightly more than the response from XML. Uh, still, uh, fun format, a little bit easier to deal with. Uh, the challenge here would be, in both cases, what happens if you have missing data? What happens if you have malformed data? Tens of thousands of these files as well for us to just understand historically what happened with all the games inside of NCAA Division I basketball. So what did we do? We went and started to build a process to look at the NCAA's data as well as sport radar data. It just wasn't about games. We had to look at schedules. We had to look at rosters. We had to look at reference data like locations, box scores, play-by-plays. Ultimately, we were sitting on around 100,000 files, all different types of schema. By the way, the, the women's game has different rules, different timing than the men's game. So we were like, oh, great. And then we had to build two different systems. Um, we had different primary keys across this data, different ways to pull it. So ultimately, we had to build a workflow around our data engineering process. So next best practice, treat data engineering as a first class citizen in your overall workflow. I see this kind of get kicked to the side a lot, like, oh, yeah, there, there's some folks working on that, that over there. They'll handle all the ingestion and transformation. And also, ingestion is a function of data engineering. So just even acquiring the data can be an extremely difficult problem. Next one, and this is what you'll see what we built, is as you start building out your ingestion and transformation workflow, build something that is repeatable and automatable. Just because you're, you can go download a couple files using some you know, HTTP JSON hack together implementation doesn't mean you can do this repeatedly over and over and over again, potentially thousands of times at scale. We used Apache Beam, and then you'll see here in a minute Cloud Dataflow to drive the majority of our ingestion and transformation process. This stuff can be a little boring because most people just want to get to predictions. But as you'll see, this is probably one of the most critical sections in building out your workflow is being able to ingest and then transform that data into something that's actionable. So we leveraged Apache Beam and then wrote a series of ETL pipelines that said, go out pull X to Y space from the NCAA for certain schema types, do some transformation on that JSON and or XML, and then ultimately load it into BigQuery. The uh, third point about uh, avoid inline mapping, you'll see this in some of the code. Uh, I've noticed sometimes people will say, oh, well, I know that this game ID over here or this value over here maps just directly to this column over here, so all I'm going to do is just read from here and write to there. To try to avoid inline mapping whenever you're doing this because ultimately something's going to change in your system either on the database side or on the input side. So 
come up with some type of common type system that you map to. And Apache Beam provides an excellent environment for you to create a type system, whether you're in Java, Python, et cetera. We're also writing this data to a cloud storage, um, to Spanner, and to some other syncs because we needed the ability to interact with this data in different types of environments. So it's another benefit of us using Apache Beam in this case is we read from one source, but then we're writing to multiple syncs. So let's go ahead and ingest all of 2016. Here's the code, some of the code that I wrote, the pipeline code. Uh, I'll make this a little bigger. It's pretty self-explanatory. So in Apache Beam, I'm going to go write a transform that knows how to go read from a particular source, in this case, all the box score summaries. And then I have a summary parser that knows how to take that JSON or XML, convert it to a Java type, and then I have a writer. And in this case, my summary writer ends up splitting a single input into three different tables. So I have a summary about the games, I have a summary about the players in those games, and I have a summary about the scoring for those games. And the beauty of this is, is I can kind of rip and replace one of my outputs. I can push it someplace else. I can add another output if I need it. And after I stitch all of my transforms together, I go ahead and hit run. I could run this locally, but I would blow up my machine because we have tens of thousands of files here. But I could do that, you know, test on a few. But let's go ahead and run this in the cloud. So hit run. And the command line is going to package up all my Apache Beam code, call out to Cloud Dataflow, kick off a job, and start reading all my files. For the sake of time, we can go look at what this looks like in the console. So if I go ahead and look at this, here is a view of one of those jobs. So I have the first step was basically loading my summaries, then I have my parser, then I have my writer. Um, we ran these jobs thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And that's the beauty of building a, a type system and then leveraging something like Apache Beam or another ETL framework in order to get this work done. Great. So we uh, just in ingest 2016, uh, a lot of our focus was around the, the, the 15 years prior to this recent March Madness. We were constantly kind of going back and pulling in 15 years, 15 years, 15 years. Now that we have some data, let's start doing some exploratory analysis. Next best practice. This one I stuck to pretty hard. If the data wasn't in BigQuery, it didn't happen. We had lots of conversations with folks on the team like, I found this super cool data or this feature, and it's really great. And I'm like, where is it? Well, it's on my laptop, or it's in the CSV file, or having a spreadsheet. It's over on GCS. I'm like, I don't care. If it's not in BigQuery, it didn't happen. Um, so consequently, folks were um, looking at, well, how do I get data into BigQuery? I don't want to go write a big uh, Apache you know, Beam job. Um, fortunately, BigQuery has a Nice UI, I can just go and say, go ahead, import CSV, import Avro, et cetera, and get data into BigQuery. Let's look at some data in BigQuery that we loaded up. This is probably the simplest one to look at. This is looking at the uh, total count of games by year for Ben's Division I basketball. I ran this one a lot just as a veri verification, like smoke test, like, yeah, there's roughly 5,971 games in a year. It doesn't really tell you much, but it's a good audit process. And I had all types of different uh, data outputs from my Apache Bean jobs or those one-off jobs in our BigQuery project. The query that just showed you is, I don't know, not very helpful. 
So I'm going to show you a, another query, which was something that, as a team, we quickly realized was a very valuable um, thing to do, which is, as we found things that were interesting, we rendered them as views and then started sharing them. So instead of just having some static SQL sitting around in source control somewhere, it's like, hey, I have a view. It has something that's interesting. I'll go ahead and share it. And a lot of these views, the, their goal were to do things like grouping by team, grouping by conference, uh, doing time series quantization, things that we had to do in order to basically aggregate data into something meaningful. So if I go here, um, this query, uh, this was one of the original ones we wrote. We were interested to see, is there a difference uh, amongst conferences? There's 32 conferences in Division I basketball. Is there a difference among conferences in their home court advantage? Do you think that there's a difference among conferences in home court advantage? Maybe. I, I don't know. Um, so I write this query. It's interesting. It shows me some data, but it's kind of hard to see what what this really means, right? So you kind of have a hunch that, yeah, there's probably a difference in home court advantage. One of the nice features inside of BigQuery is that I can click on the outputs of my query and say, visualize inside of Data Studio. And in this case, I want to look at the home point advantage, which was the output of my query. And I can quickly visualize that, yes, there is a difference between Pac-12 playing at home. They're favored by about four and a half points on average versus the Ivy League or the Big South or MAC. So I haven't built any predictions yet, but I'm starting to kind of gain some insight on like what things could be skillful in terms of building out predictions. Say if you have a Pac-12 team playing a colonial team, during March Madness. Keep in mind, though, that they're playing on neutral courts, so we have another problem to solve. But this is an amazing way to start exploring your data. By the way, Data Studio is free, and all of the uh, visualizations that you build inside of it are easily shareable. If you've played with Google Docs, go ahead and click Share. People have access to your data. Oops, don't want to do that. All right. So we can explore data in BigQuery. We built views to satisfy common use cases. We also spent some time looking at um, our audit logs and just talking to folks like, hey, what are you building? What are you writing? And they're like, oh, I wrote this cool query. Um, great. Let's go ahead and materialize that a viewer as a table so you stop running the query over and over again and you get a little bit more efficient. The next thing that we did was look at some visualization techniques outside of BigQuery and Data Studio, which is um, using Cloud Data Lab. So Cloud Data Lab is a, uh, a uh, hostable uh, implementation of IPython Notebook. You can run it locally in a Docker container. You could also run it um, on the cloud. Go ahead and f just use the, our G Cloud commands to go create a data lab instance, and I have a fully uh, fleshed out IPython development environment that is optimized for the Google Cloud. And once you're there, you can do something like this. I'm in my IPython notebook. Make this a little bit bigger. And I take my big query that I wrote. This is for a different type of analysis move it over into Data Lab. I execute that query. It's a fairly big query. Um, I pump it into a data frame and do some visualization. So this visualization was focused on understanding how players on teams on an individual basis uh, contribute to the three points that a team is scoring. So in this case, Kentucky, on average, has three players that contribute the majority of their three-point uh, three production versus Davidson, who has five different folks who are contributing to the three-point production. So you could look at this and start to make some inferences like, 
hmm, three guys versus five guys who are able to produce three pointers, who has the advantage? All right. So I can visualize in Data Studio sitting on top of BigQuery. I can visualize inside of Data Lab sitting on top of BigQuery. By the way, if you go out to medium.com and look for analyzing NCAA college basketball with GCP, we have about 30 articles that kind of reinforce some of the, uh, we'll call them like classic visualizations and, and feature ideas that we were coming up with. So best practice here, if you think something is interesting, visualize it. If you don't know if something is interesting, visualize it. If you find something that you thought was interesting and it turns out not to be interesting, visualize it and share it with the team. So. All right, so now we're gonna go from kind of exploratory analysis to looking at some features. Um, some things to keep in mind, all 351 teams in uh, Division I basketball are not equal in strength and performance. If that was the case, man, this would be a really, really hard tournament to uh, pick, pick the teams. Um, but in our case, we wouldn't necessarily know who all the final four teams were until a week out. So as we we're thinking about features and what type of models we would build, um, we kind of had a plan for a very, very broad set of use cases. From there, as we started to drive into our, our, the features that we were going to use, then we had to stop and say, well, what are we predicting on? Like, we still haven't gotten there. So the conversations between the, the tech folks and the business folks, we came down to these 28 predictions. So we had predictions focused on single team, and we had predictions focused on combined stats between teams. And then we also had these predictions around game state, um, focused on close and late and down to the wire. In essence, we had to go build 28 predictions for each of these games across these categories. So this is the, um, uh, the, the, the number of predictions. And then looking into those kind of prediction categories, we started looking at, well, what's interesting? What makes three-point attempts interesting or possessions interesting? So before you saw up there, it was said 130 was the estimate for the number of position, possessions. So on this slide, we looked at the, the distribution of all of these stats across 2017 men's Division I basketball, and it turns out um, you know, 130 possessions would be roughly around um, the 50th percentile down in the, in the bottom. Now, keep in mind, this is across all teams. We don't necessarily know who's going to play in the championship game or Final Four, but this gives you some indication about what is interesting. Where would those numbers fall uh, if you were looking at all teams? So the next thing to do was we knew which kind of prediction categories we wanted to go after. We knew potentially what was interesting. Then we had to figure out, well, are we going to use what type of modeling techniques are we going to use here? Are we going to use regression techniques? Are we going to use classification techniques? So if you're new to this, this is a real quick slide. The idea of regression is I'm going to take um, some input variables and then output some continuous variable. And the whole idea is I'm trying to build a function to do this, uh, the, the magic of machine learning. So my input variables would be all these different stats, and the output variable would be how many possessions are going to be in this game, or how many three-point attempts are going to be in this game. From a classification perspective, again, n number of variables, and then output some discrete variable. So is this game going to be close and late? Yes or no? So you have some type of binary classification. The question here is, what is x? What features should you use to drive these models? Um, this is the hardest part. Um, this is like saying, like, uh, I, don't, I had some funny things to say, but the, like, it's, it's like, where do babies come from? Like, like you, we kind of know where babies come from, but like the process is there's, there's all different types of things that happen. And like, how do you stitch all of these things together uh, in order to create some type of successful function? And this is the whole process of doing your feature exploration and feature engineering. So going back to our data, we started talking to folks and say, OK, we have data about conference and seasons and games and players and segments, et cetera. Oh, by the way, we're not using one tool. We're using Tableau and Jupyter and RStudio and CoLab, et cetera. But everyone was able to 
rally around using BigQuery as the center of truth for the data. You want to use RStudio? Awesome. Rock. Easy connectivity to BigQuery. You're in Colab? Go for it. Everyone was looking at the same data. So from here, we can then look at what features could potentially be skillful. Um, this was a, a, a model that we wrote. It was a classification feature to see if a game would fall into higher than the 75th percentile for a particular uh, stat. I think in this case, it was three-point attempts. So we would start with hundreds and hundreds of features, and using different techniques, we could start to look at which features were most skillful, which ones were going to give signal uh, to drive a prediction. Um, interestingly enough, if you're looking at three-point attempts, one of the most skillful features is the average of three-point attempts by a team in their last seven games. Um, that's an easy one, but you know, if you only had one feature, your model may not be very powerful. So we go searching for more features and looking at things like, uh, let me scroll down here and find one, another one that's interesting. You know, free throws, the attempt, you know, attempts in a average seven game. You can see there's a little bit of distribution between the, these two. Um, so there are different techniques to go through your feature selection process. The point here is that whatever tool that you're choosing has access um, to the same data. And as we were doing our work, one of the guys in the audience was, was on the team, we, we would be saying like, hey, like in my process, I see that this feature is really skillful. Great, go ahead and put it back into a view so then everyone can use it. So best practice. So use views to help build out your features that you're selecting. Um, version them. This was another thing that people were like, oh, I, a week ago I had a feature that seemed to be pretty skillful, but now where did that thing go? So use views and just version them. Um, another best practice, use SQL as much as possible to build the aggregations for your features. I had lots of conversations with people that, and they would say, I wrote this wicked pandas code. In, uh, in IPython that extracts data, does a bunch of aggregation and loops and blah, 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 and I have awesome features. I'm like, great, um, could, could I have that? And then they send the code, check it in, and I run it. I'm like, hey, th this takes an hour and a half to run. Um, and 95% of that could have been done in SQL. Could we take that process and put it into SQL so then I can just leverage BigQuery to push all that down and run it in 12 seconds? Uh, now, granted, there are some cases where you can't do that. And, uh, you know, but if you're not trying to do it, then you won't necessarily know at what point do you need to jump out of some handcrafted environment and leverage SQL. Oh, other best practice. All engineering artifacts should live in source control. Persistent disks attached to VMs does not qualify as source control. Um, your laptop that you think is secure does not satisfy as source control. Build a system, get whatever workflow you want to use, make sure you're checking everything in. So it's just not about code, it's about SQL, it's about your notebooks, it's about your ideas. Um, so we talked about uh, some feature analysis. Now, let's get into modeling and make some, some predictions. So. We um, used five different uh, um, tools to build out our models. And we used BigQuery ML, which was announced yesterday, and it was a lifesaver on this product or on this project. We used Scikit-Learn heavily. We used uh, XGBoost. We used Keras and a little bit of TensorFlow. Uh, again, and the whole idea was whether we were building a regression model or a classification model, we were using these tools because these are the tools that were helping us build the best performance, not necessarily because that was the tool that we liked. So you'll see this in a minute. Choose, those, choose the tool that works, not the tool that you like to use. And I'm going to jump over to the first one um, that I'm going to show you is our close and late model. Um, how many of you would like to know if a game was going to end close and late at halftime so you knew whether you should just leave 
um, or stay at home. All right. OK, so we built this close and late model. And the person that built it um, did all the right things. They wrote down the business requirements. They were very, very, very precise about what this definition of close and late meant versus down to the wire meant. Um, there's all the SQL that were driving the feature inputs and talked about what types of features that matter. And then ultimately, we built uh, some visualization to show if this model would trigger or not. So our minimum threshold for running an ad around a uh, prediction was a minimum. It had to be 65% confident, so 65% probability that this was going to happen. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't move forward. So at halftime, the Villanova score was 37, uh, Michigan 28. So Villanova was up by 9. And if you look at this graphic, Villanova's down here. Here's Villanova whenever they're up by 10. We weren't even close to hitting 65% probability on this, which was awesome because we knew that this was the decision we were not going to. This was a decision we were not going to make. We would not, you know, we would not run this ad. Um, so this is close and late, and uh, the, the sad part is that none of the final four games uh, ended up close and late. And uh, we did a ton of work and never ran the, the ad. Uh, <laughs> no. uh, but it was a lot of fun. Um, another uh, modeling technique that we used was BigQuery ML. So now we're back into BigQuery. So I took all those steps of like feature engineering, visualization, et cetera, et cetera. Now with BigQuery ML, I have the ability to build uh, a model straight in line. And here's the code. Basically, you say create or replace model, uh, which is a functionally just a view inside of um, your data set. I go ahead and select the features that I want to use. So I go ahead and select from this really, really, really wide view of features. Go ahead and train. Um, in this case, I want to build a linear regression model. And it will output a model for me then to score. So I have already built this model. I go ahead and flip to the other view, which is now I want to predict. And I say I need to select from the game that I want to look at. So in this case, it was the championship game. I'm going to go ahead and pull in all the stats up through the first half and then uh, run the query. Check that. This was all the stats prior right up to the game. So we were trying to predict on total three-point attempts. So our estimate for that game was 50. Uh, sorry, the estimate was 49.85, and the actual value was 50. So we had 28 different versions of these models predicting on all different stats, and we would, would run them in real time for us to then build out a, a decision tree for which ad we would run on TV. Right. So we've gotten all the way through this process, and we're sitting in the truck, and we're ready to make a decision. How did we do it? Um, by the way, I, I can't underscore the amount of pressure that we were feeling because we had to deliver an ad. Um, and that's kind of fun. Uh, so what did we do? We had uh, automation for serving um, each path. So we had automation for uh, people using BigQuery. We had automation for people that were using TensorFlow. Uh, in some cases, some of our automation was manual. Like we had a person whose job it was. We're like, okay, hey, I'm running this model. This is how the thing works. Here are the data inputs that I need. But the outputs of all of the, the automation <laughs> drove everything into Google Sheets. It's a low-fi way, kind of a low-tech to do it. And it turns out it worked really, really well because we could easily share all this data with everyone. Um, it was e we had to do nothing to build it out other, other than write some script in our automation that says, OK, right now, here's the state of all the predictions that we want to make. Pick the one that feels the best. And at halftime, this is what um, we ended up looking at, which is we ended up picking you know, three points attempt combined uh, at the second half. And with that data, we then moved over to another system. Uh, so part of this process for this overall workflow are the ad agency and creative agency that we worked with, Eleven, uh, here in San Francisco, uh, built out a, an encoding system that ran on the cloud that could take inputs and then encode a live ad in around 30 seconds. 
Um, so this is the workflow that we use. So we took the output of our predictions, put them into the, uh, into the uh, encoding environment, and then, boom, outputs an ad. What I don't show you here is we had a war room of around 100 different scenarios that could po possibly be happening. It just wasn't around like three-point attempts. It was three-point attempts, and the underdog is winning, or possessions, and the favorite team is up by 50. Like, we had all these different scenarios that we had to come up with because the visualization that you, also, that you ultimately see in the ad had to match the context of the game. Just because I could give you a prediction doesn't necessarily mean it would resonate well unless the visuals met the context of the game. So with that, then we had that encoded ad and we trafficked it. And that was a super fun process because we were literally on the phone with the folks at uh, Turner and CBS, uh, their ad trafficking people, and said, yeah, we got your ad, it's going to run. And we sat there, and about two minutes later, that ad was on national television. You know, eight minutes prior, nine minutes prior, the ad didn't exist. The prediction didn't exist. Um, I remember one of the, our, we have this verification process to understand what happened, when, and why. And I think in one of the ads, there was a, like a cat, I think, on the, on the back of a turtle. Um, is that right? Yeah. There was a cat on the back of a turtle, and, and you hear our, our auditor talking to their auditor, and the lady says, yes, I can confirm that there is a cat on the back of the turtle. And, the <laughs> and then they hang up the phone, and then the ad runs. And uh, so, so another best practice was we implemented a process to audit, audit the chain of command regarding the decision making. So as those predictions came out of the system, we were looking at them. We had a whole process to figure out, okay, this is good, this is bad, this reaches threshold, this doesn't, et cetera. Write everything down. Who said what when? and then go. So it, especially when, if you have humans involved, this is, this is of paramount importance. If this could, was completely automated, you would still have an audit log because infrequently, you know, frequently something's gonna happen with some automated process, you have bugs and you need to go fix it. So definitely implement some type of audit process for this type of flow. So how did we do? Um, we had uh, six different games and what we ran on TV were the uh, implied probabilities for each one of our predictions. So we had an estimate. We had some type of continuous value that came out of our prediction models. And you can see down at the bottom where we said second half total three-point attempts combined was uh, the estimate was 24. Uh, the result was 24. So we nailed the estimate. The ad that actually ran was we will see at least 21 of these things at a 76%, 76.4% confidence level. And this one, uh, the, the reason why we did this is that, you know, a television ad, we couldn't put things like confidence intervals and plus minus and stuff in the ad, so we did some work to basically take our estimate and convert it into a probability. So we nailed that one. We nailed the uh, combined possessions one. Um, total shot attempts, we got a little uh, squirrely there because the Kansas Villanova game, kind of got out of hand. Um, and that's the whole fun of this, is like you think you know what's going to happen in the game, and then the game gets away, and you know, sometimes your estimates are off. If you want to learn more about this process, we built a half of a basketball court in the bottom of Moscone South. How many of you have been down there yet? All right, cool. Um, feel free to come down. Uh, I can get into any part of this that, that you'd like. And we also have a, a real-time motion capture system set up that you can see how good or bad your jump shot is. And it's a fun way to get into data science uh, from a different angle. Just looking at scores, like that's kind of fun. You can build live TV ads. I mean, that's, that's OK. But seeing yourself in real time shooting a jumper, uh, that's pretty fun. So with that said, I'll stop, take some questions. And I hope you have a great rest of next.